I'm happy to introduce Dr. Saruti Hooks. He's with University of Maryland Extension um, and in the Department of Entomology. And um, he's going to be talking about the stink bug and um, organic production as well. So uh, he's done a lot of work in that area, and we're glad to have him here today. Thank you, Shannon. So I guess what I'm going to talk today is organic production with respect to management of the brown marmorate stink bug. And some of what I present today will be based on some research that I conduct, and other will be based on the biology of this insect, what we think will work, and then I'll be researching some of these tactics in the future. So I start off with my outline, and this is what I'm going to talk about today. There will be a brief introduction. Then I'll so show some preliminary assessment information I found with respect to natural enemies and their impact on brown marmorate stink bug and eggplant and pepper. Then I go into some conservation bowel control experiments that I've conducted, again, targeting the brown marmorate stink bug. And then I'll go into what I think could work with respect to ecological management. I'll talk about some organic products that were tested. And then in the end, I'll talk about some integrated IPM approaches. And I, and I specifically, I like using that term integrated IPM because that's what it's all about. So just to get some brief background on information, this insect, the brown marmorate stink bug, did originate from Southeast Asia. Um, native of the Koreas, both South and North Korea, as well as Japan and China and Taiwan. So the significance of this is that when you're trying to develop a biological control program for the exotic organisms, sometimes it can be a bit tough. And that's because sometimes when they come into a country without their natural enemies, it's sort of a toss-up whether the natural enemies that you have there will move over and do a substantial um, job with respect to mitigating that population. So a little bit about the biology. There are five nymphal stages. Um, on the left here, you can see this is the um, first instar stage. And this is actually a non-feeding stage. The first instar stage doesn't feed. It basically stays around that egg mass. And it, and it takes up the simian, which the mother deposits on the egg. And then here you see the second instar. Once it reaches that second instar, that's when it starts to mobilize and starts feeding. And here we see a second and a fifth instar, and you start to see those distinguishing features. You see the white stripe here on the antenna, and as well as the white stripe there on the leg. So when this insect first arrived in Maryland, I felt that you're going to have to really have an integrated approach to control. It's not just going to be a one method approach. In other words, we need to look at both biological control as well as ecological management. Some people may call this cultural control. And then also look at different insecticide management practices and try to integrate these with respect to control. So with respect to biological control, you have three choices of strategy that you can choose from. One is importation, also called classical bowel control. And this is one that you think will work for the brown marmorate stink bug. Again, one of the things I mentioned earlier is that when you have a exotic organism to come into a place without its native natural enemies, there's a chance that the local natural enemy population you have there will not be able to suppress it. So sometimes what people would do is go back to the country of origin. Because if you find a pest in this country of origin, typically it's not a pest, and that's because there's already natural enemies that grew up with it, has worked, has been with it, and is able to suppress it. So sometimes they will go there and find some natural enemies that show good benefit and bring them back, do the testing to make sure it won't harm non-targets, and then determine if they're going to release it. Another strategy is augmentation. In augmentation, you may already have a natural enemy that's already doing a good job, but you may need to enhance its number. So a lot of times what they would do is mass rear this particular natural enemy and then release it and then it would help bring that pest under control. And then the final strategy, one in which I like to use a lot, is conservation. Generally, you have natural enemies out there, and there may be something that prevent them from reaching their capacity to control that particular pest. You may be using this uh, insecticide or pesticide that may be damaging to that particular natural enemy. So one way to do is just stop using that particular insecticide. In other instances, there may be some sort of resource that it needs. It may be a food source that it needs, and perhaps you can move that food source out near your cropping system, and that can enhance the number, enhance their activity density. But before I choose from those particular strategies, there's one thing I need to find out. First, I need to find out what are the species composition of natural enemy, what biocontrol organisms are already out there attacking, or if there are any. If there are none that are doing a good job, then it may mean we need to go to strategy one, which is importation. So Kim Homer, 
works for USDA in Delaware, he has been doing some survey of natural enemy. And what he's finding is that they're not having that great of an impact. He's finding the parasitization rate and attack rates are very low. However, most of Kim's work has been done in urban settings, such as ornamental types of um, areas. So what we need to do is find out, we may find that the natural enemy complex that he's finding in these urban areas, such as the ornamental plants, may differ from what we find in vegetable system and field system. So that's one of the things I was interested in doing, is going out into these vegetable systems and seeing what sort of natural enemies we have there and what are their impact. And then once I determine that, then I can go and try to choose which one of these strategies I think will work best. So basically I did some survey work in, in 2011 this past summer in which I went into different fields and basically these were more like small plots, um, different vegetable plots and also field crops. And my interest was trying to determine what was the composition of natural enemies or do we have, you know, we have local stink bugs. So my interest was are those natural enemies that are controlling the local stink bugs, are they having an impact on this new exotic organism? And what I decided to focus on was the egg stage of the brown marrow stink bug. And the reason why I focus mostly on the egg stage because this is the weak link in their life cycle. This egg stage is going to be immobile. You can have wasps, which are these parasitoids that come in, lay their eggs inside of the, the, this brown marrow stink bug egg, and that egg can't fight back. You can have different predators come and feed on this egg, and that egg can't fight back. But the thing with the brown marrow stink bug, the older it gets, the less likely there's going to be a natural enemy out there that can successfully attack it. So I consider the egg the weak link in their life cycle. So that's what I want to follow to see what kind of impact natural enemies are having on the egg stage. So basically we, what we did was we would go through these different cropping systems and we would look for eggs. And when we find eggs, we would mark them and then we would try to monitor the fate of these eggs. And some of the things we were looking for is whether these eggs were being attacked by chewing predators, whether these eggs were being attacked by parasitoids. And parasitoids, I remind you of these are wasps that would go and lay their eggs inside of the brown marrow stink bug eggs. Then their eggs will hatch. Basically, they eat the inside of the brown marrow stink bug. They come out, they mate, they look for food, and basically their whole life cycle is eat, attack brown marrow stink bug eggs, or attack whatever host they're going after, and, and basically, that's their entire cycle. We were also looking for unknown mortality. Unknown mortality just means, simply means that the egg didn't hatch, but we're not sure why. And then we have sucking predators. These one have needle-like mouth parts. Basically, they will poke that little needle-like mouth part into the egg of the brown marrow stink bug egg and suck out the content. And then we looked at the number that successfully hatched into that first instar nymph. So first starting out with eggplant. Here on the x-axis, we have the fate of those eggs that we found in eggplant, and this is the number of brown marrow stink bug egg. So in that eggplant system, we found a total of 522 brown marrow stink bug eggs. Out of those 522 eggs, 221 up here represents the percentage, 42% successfully hatched. Predators, 91 of those eggs were eaten by predators, representing 17%. Parasitization was represented 23%. And then we have this unknown mortality, 89 represents 17 percent. Now this unknown mortality in itself could be due to natural enemies. What you may have is that a parasitoid will go in and lay her egg inside of that egg, but it doesn't successfully hatch, but still it kills the brown marrow stink bug egg, prevents it from hatching. You also have made some of these sucking predators. These sucking predators have very needle-like mouth parts, and they could have poked in there and did some injury, not enough to cause that egg to collapse so that that damage wouldn't be noticeable, but they still could have caused some of this mortality. We also looked in peppers. Now in this peppers, the x-axis is the same, the fate of these eggs, and this is the number of eggs, but I should explain that we listed this in egg masses, not individual eggs. So you take in consideration that what we found was that a egg mass consisted of about 25 to 26 eggs. So you take this numbers, all of these numbers, and you multiply it by 25 or 26, and that's how many we found. And basically what we found is hatch, there was 8 times 26 representing 42 percent. Predation, 3, 16 percent. Uh, parasitization was at 26 percent. And unknown mortality, there was only one egg mass representing 5 percent. 
And then we also have a new category here we call missing. And sometimes that will happen. We could go out, we would find an egg, we mark that egg, we go out the next day, it's completely gone, disappeared as though it never existed. And it's not because the egg, the nymph hatched and left, because remember that first instar stage is a non-feeding stage. It doesn't leave that egg mass. So we don't know if there's some predator that's out there that's really good and completely clean the egg and all any, any evidence that egg existed, or maybe the weather, extreme weather conditions may completely moved, remove that egg from the plant. But we did find some that was just missing. Now I go back, and one of the things I mentioned early on, I said before developing the strategy, whether we're going to use importation, augmentation, conservation, the first step is to determine what the natural enemies are out there and what they're doing. Well, in this particular instance, I didn't do that. I went straight to try to look at cover crops to see what kind of impact they will have. And the reason why I did that is because I was already working with cover crops and corn and soybeans. So it was very easy for me just to determine if these cover crops themselves were having some sort of impact on the ability of natural enemies to control the brown marrow stink bug. And I'll start out with a corn trial. And this particular corn trial, the methods where we planted these cover crops in the fall, which is basically similar to what everyone do. But this second step is when we did things a little bit different. You know, generally when people plant their cover crops, um, at least in synthetic system, they would go in and burn it down with a herbicide. But what we did was we planted the corn directly into the cover crop, like it's a living mulch. We planted the corn seeds directly into this standing cover crop. And then before the corn plant became too tall, that's when we went in and flare mode. And the purpose of doing this is that another component of this study was trying to get good weed control. And I felt that we could get good weed control if we could get as much biomass out of that cover crop as possible, flare mower, and then have a nice little hay mulch. But at the same time, I also felt that also could contribute to the, to the activity density of these natural enemies. And then, of course, after flare mowing, at that particular point is when we started taking data. And the cover crops that we decided to use, one being crimson clover, of course, it's a legume fixer. We also use rye, has a very high C to N ratio. And then I used the cover, a crimson clover rye mix. And then, of course, there was a no cover crop check. Now, the first thing I do before I go in to show you what those the impact, those individual treatments, I want to show you what we found overall. And again, here is the fate of the brown marrow stink bug eggs, and these are the number of eggs. So overall, we found a total of 923 eggs. Out of those 923 eggs, only 84 hatched. That represented about 9%. Then we had 246, represent 30%, that were eaten by predators. 529, look at that. 55% of those were actually parasitized. The wasp came in and laid its egg inside and killed it. And then we have unknown mortality. And again, this unknown mortality could be due to natural enemies. Now let's break it down by the individual treatments. So here, remember, the corn was planted into a rye crimson clover mix, then a crimson clover cover crop, a rye, and then there was a no cover crop check. And basically, the blue, and this is just, again, the number of eggs. These are the total number of eggs that we found in those particular um, plots. And again, overall, there was 923 eggs. So basically what we found here, the blue represents the number that hatched, the white represents the percentage that were eaten by predators, yellow represents parasitization, and the gray represents unknown mortality. And basically if you look here at the blue, those eggs didn't do very well in any of those treatments. But there was an interesting finding here. If you look here, wherever that rye cover crop showed up, look at that rate of parasitization. 72.5 in the rye crimson clover and around 70% in the rye. So it seemed to be something was going on with that rye cover crop and those parasitoids' ability to attack those eggs or at least find them. So we also did a similar study in soybeans. And again, the steps were pretty much the same except step two. In step two, instead of trying to plant the, the, the soybean seed into that standing cover crop, we first flare mow that cover crop. And the reason is because Soybean seeds isn't as tough as corn seed. I didn't think it would come up very well into that cover crop unless we flare mold and let it sit for a few days. 
and the cover crops, we use different cover crops. In this particular, we still use one of the grass cover crops. We use barley. Then we use this Austrian winter pea, which I feel is quite impressive. That's a, a lot, tremendous amount of biomass. And I mean, you're not going to get any weeds to come out through that. And then we did an Austrian winter pea and a barley mix. And then, of course, there was the uh, no cover crop check. So let's show the results here again. And here we, we put it into, I added more categories. I sort of broke it down and not just predators, but I broke it down into chewing predators as well as sucking predators. And basically here we have our soybean planted into the um, different cover crop treatments. Australian went to pea and barley, barley, AWP, and then the no cover crop check. And again, this white represents normal hatch. And what do we mean by normal hatch? Again, typically we would find 25 to 26 egg per egg mass, and a normal hatch would indicate that pretty much all those eggs successfully hatched into first instar nymphs. So this, I should mention that this is presented again in egg masses as opposed to individual eggs. So these numbers out here represents the number of egg masses. And so you multiply that by 26 and you got the number. So basically we can see normal hatch, here, and then this is low hatch. And what do we mean by low hatch? Again, generally there's 25 to 26 eggs per egg mass, and low hatch will mean no more than five of those successfully hatched into first instar nymphs. But in most occasions, it was no more than two or three. And then the green represent missing. I sort of told you about that. Sometimes we go out there and it simply is missing. And we had a high percentage of eggs that basically disappeared from those no cover crop check treatment plots. And then the blue represents mortality due to chewing predators. Yellow represents mortality due to sucking predators. And then this outline here, gray, represents mortality due to paras parasitism. Again, these are the small wasps. But what we can say is most of the mortality that we saw was due to sucking predators. As you see here, this yellow represents sucking predators. But this low hatch situation here, that was mostly due to these sucking predators. In other words, they will go through and they will probe most of those eggs. They may miss a few and that's where we got the low hatch. The other thing I noticed about these data, if, if you remember a couple of slides back, in those corn, what I saw was wherever that rye cover crop showed up, we have a higher rate of parasitization. Well, we had a similar thing here with the barley cover crop. You can see wherever that barley showed up, another grass cover crop, we had higher rate of parasitization compared to these other systems. And I should mention, you may think, well, why is the parasitization rate so much lower in soybean than what I showed in corn? And it may have been more to do with the protocol. With the corn is, once we found those eggs, we allowed those eggs to stay on the corn plant about 48 hours, and then we would collect the eggs and bring them in the lab to monitor to look at the fate. And that's mainly because we were more interested in parasitization. The nature of this soybean study was that I couldn't remove the eggs. So basically they would stay out there. So sometimes what would happen is we would have these eggs with parasitized. And you can tell when an egg is parasitized because it starts to turn a, a grayish color. But sometimes these sucking predators or chewing predators would go out and feed on the parasitized egg. So when I had to classify, I had to classify the mortality due to predators because they are the ones who, who eventually killed the host. So the question is, who was responsible for this mortality? And in some instances, we were able to catch these guys out there feeding on the um, brown marsh stink bug eggs, and there may have been some that we missed. So one in particular, this is called Geochorus, known as the big eye bug. And here, and that's because it has big eyes. And what it has here, and this is one with the sucking, of sucking mouth part. So here there's a needle-like mouth part. And this is a first instar brown marsh stink bug nymph. And this was on a pepper plant. Now when I looked underneath that pepper plant, what I found was another geocris feeding on another brown marsh stink bug nymph. So I said, this is a little strange. So I looked a little closer and what I found was there was an egg mass that had just recently hatched. And basically what these guys were doing was going to that egg mass and basically picking these guys off like they were red M&Ms or something and eating them. And I want to show this picture is because this sort of gives you an indication that an egg has been attacked by a sucking predator. If you look here, it looks like someone come and punch this inside of that egg. 
And that's what can happen sometimes. When a sucking predator sticks its mouth parts in the egg and starts taking out the content, sometimes that egg collapses. So if you see an egg like that, it may be an indication that a sucking predator got to that egg. We also found jumping spiders. And jumping spiders, they would feed on both the eggs and the early nymphal stage. And this is maybe a second or third nymphal stage. Um, so they were, we found them in corn, we found them in soybeans, we found them on vegetable plants. So they definitely would go after the um, brown barber stink bug. I should also mention that big eye bug that I showed early. It also feeds on the egg stage. And this little guy here is called soft winged flower beetle. We did find it feeding on the eggs in corn. We also found it in soybeans, but I was never able to witness it feeding on anything. And that's because it's somewhat fidgety. Once I got really close to it, it would just take off. So I was never able to, to um, photograph it feeding on anything in soybean. And this is what we call an immature soldier beetle. We found it feeding on the eggs. And I guess the adults would look similar. If you know what a firefly looks like or what we call lightning bug, the adults look something similar to that. And we also found praying mantis. Now, we never actually witnessed the praying mantis feeding on brown mark stink bug, but it is known that they will. And some of my colleagues have actually filmed them in the field feeding on it. And they will go after the, uh, the adults. And here, what we have is an immature lacewing. And what we found with the lace wings, we found that, you know, lace wings, they have these little pincher that they stick inside their prey. And we found that they could never successfully penetrate the egg. And this is an early larva stage. So I don't know as they get older, maybe they can successfully penetrate those eggs. And this is an ant. And this isn't a real ant, but I couldn't photograph the ant in the field, so. But what we would find, I found something similar with the ants as I found with the lace wing. They would try to remove those eggs, but they could not successfully do it. And ants are known. They have the capability of removing stink bug eggs. So it may have been just the species that we saw in the field was not capable of doing that. But the one thing about those ants, if that egg was in any way injured, then they would basically clean it out. And you can always tell when ants have scavenged a plant with brown marrow stink bug eggs, because this is what you see left behind. It's almost like empty eggshell, and that's a good indication that ants went there and cleaned it out. And I would think even if the first instar nymph is trying to come out of that egg stage, the ants will go and attack it and, and kill it at that particular time also. Now what about the wasps? We saw a lot of parasitization going on. Now one of the wasps that I would say was most responsible for that is this little small female here, it's Trisocus. I'm not sure of the genus yet, but we know it's a Trisocus wasp. And Trisocus wasps are known to attack stink bug eggs. And the interesting thing about this wasp is that when it lands on an egg mass, it basically will go through and parasitize every single egg. It doesn't miss an egg. And the other thing is, what you would notice is probably she has already parasitized these eggs. Now it looks like she's decided to take a dump on the egg. But she's not really taking a dump. Basically what she's doing is guarding those eggs. And the reason why the parasitor would do that is if she parasitizes all these eggs and then she fly off, there's a chance that another female could come in and parasitize those eggs. And th that female may outcompete her eggs. So this is one way in ensuring that her offsprings make it. And in here, you can't see this very well, but this is one sitting. So on some occasion, we'll go to a field and we will see them there. You go back the next day, she's still there squatting. And even in instances where we collect them, we collect the leaves, collect the eggs from the plant in the field, and she still would not leave those eggs. So we bring them back in the lab, put them in a petri dish, and she's still sitting there guarding her eggs. And I want to show this picture. This is actually the local stink bug. This is probably the green stink bug. But I'm showing this because you notice this grayish, blackish appearance. And when those eggs are parasitized, that's the sort of color they turn. And also you can see here, it's very ragged. And that's because these parasitoids are chewing their way out of those eggs. If this had been a natural stink bug nymph to come out, that would be a much cleaner cut. So let's go back to this slide. Um, one of the things I talked about is the first thing in deciding to determine which strategy you need to use, whether you want to import tape, go and track down some natural enemies from a foreign country, or augment, you have some there, you want to increase their numbers, or conservation approach, in which you know what's out there, and now you want to try to see if you can help them along. 
And I think I would choose to go with this conservation approach. And it's mainly because of that Trisocus parasitoris. That little parasitoris, the one I tell you looks like it want to take a dump on the eggs. Well, the one thing that they have done is that they have done some studies and they found that this particular parasitor, when it feeds on the flower, nectar, or French marigold, it increases its longevity and fecundity. So what do we mean by that? Longevity means its lifespan. It lives longer. And fecundity means it can produce more eggs, so it can lay more eggs in the host. So my interest would be if I can put these marigold plants surrounded by, say, soybean fields, can I enhance the activity of this parasitoid? Basically, I'm giving it something to feed. And you think about this, the, the reason why it should work is, one is that the brown marmot stink bug is a perimeter colonizer. It likes to colonize the perimeter of the field. So it, won't, it typically would not move into the interior of a field unless the population gets really high. So basically, if you have these flowering plants here, you have these parasites, these brown marmot stink bugs are laying eggs here on the perimeter. You have these parasitoids, they will go visit these flowering plants, get a source of food, and then they can move a few steps over and start parasitizing those eggs. So in theory, you would think this should work. So this is one of the things I want to test next summer. Now let's talk a little bit about ecological management. So with respect to biocontrol, we, we, I am finding that the local natural enemies, the ones that are keeping our local stink bugs in check, they are moving on to the brown marmot stink bug. And I certainly have to do some more work with cover crops, in particular to see what's going on with these grass cover crops, why I'm getting a higher rate of parasitization, and also testing some of these hypotheses with regards to these flower and border plants. So moving on to ecological management. Well, one of the things I think we can do with respect to ecological management, if possible, is we need to plant these crops away, susceptible crops from high-risk area. And what do we mean by high-risk area? There are places where this brown marmot stink bug go to overwinter, and we know about these areas. This past summer, one of my graduate students, she went out to some various cornfields, and basically her interest was determined is, how does habitat surrounding a cornfield impact the ability of the brown marmot stink bug to colonize a particular crop? So basically she went to cornfields, different cornfields that was bordering woodlots, cornfields that were bordering rows, corns that were, here we have houses, but it's actually buildings. This could be warehouses, barns, just buildings in general, and also, cornfields surrounding other crops. And basically what she found was that those cornfields that were neighboring buildings tended to have higher number of stink bugs per corn plant. And this was both brown marmot stink bug and local stink bugs. And, and then those surrounding woodlots and other crops also have high numbers. Now the interesting thing is although she found a higher number of plants next to buildings, they didn't move as far into the interior of the crop Typically, you would find them around 20 feet into the corn plant, and then it's as though they basically dropped off the planet. But in these other systems, you would find them deeper into the corn field. So based on this preliminary assessment, and we have to do more work to verify this, we would say that buildings such as barns, places where they overwinter, as well as woodlots, planting next to these areas, these are high-risk areas, so it's a good chance that you're going to have brown marsh stink bug population or higher population. Another thing is that it's one of the things when we try to develop management strategy, we try to determine a weak link in the life cycle of that particular insect. So I mentioned one of the weak links is the egg stage because it's immobile and it can't fight back. But I think another weak link about this particular guy is it's, is it's very prolificous. It feeds on a number of different crop systems. And some people say, well, that's not a weak link. That's a, that's a, uh, that's a terrible thing. But I think when you have something that can feed on over 300 host plants, it's got to have something that it likes better. So that's where we could zero in. If there are crops or plants that it's like better, perhaps we can use those as trap crops and protect our cash crop. And just mentioned here we have some beans. These beans, uh, beans is fibaceous. So this is damaged by the brown marmot stink bug. Also okra, I can't understand why any insect would like okra, but they also like okra, Malvasia family. And of course, solanaceous, such as peppers, where here we see the, the cloudiness of the pepper. Of course, tomatoes, again, cloudiness here, damage from tomatoes. But there are some that they, 
they less are less preferred. And I use the term less preferred, and the reason is because I can say that I'm certain that these, that I can list some crops that I would say the brown mark stink bugs simply don't like, and then there would be someone to say, no, I found them on my farm and they're attacking this particular crop. So I like to use the term less preferred host. Um, some other cucurbits such as watermelons, honeydew, cantaloupe, and then some other greens such as kale, broccoli, um, even cucumbers. I find stink bugs and cucumber, but I would say it's not one of their favorite hosts. And even squash. We can't get a brown mark stink bug to, a, to attack squash. They don't go for it. But there are some other states that swear out that they love it, and they think squash could be used as a trap crop for this particular bug. And then peppers. I show some damage to peppers, but what some people have found is that they tend to stay away from really hot peppers. And then also there was an observational study that we, that we found um, in 2011 that dark peppers, for some reason they tend to stay away from dark peppers. And we don't know if this is a fluke or is this something that um, they prefer not to attack those. So what this means is this is an opportunity to use a trap crop. So, from the previous slide, what we know, we sort of know what habitats they overwinter in, what habitats they were coming out of. So we can set up a trap for them. And I, I call it a trap crop, but it's probably more of an interception plant. It's something that intercepts them. For instance, we know that they overwinter in woodlots. So basically, if they're overwintering woodlots, and say your pepper is your cash crop, if you don't have anything here, what's going to happen? Once they leave that woodlots, they're going to go right for your pepper crop. But then maybe you can use a trap crop here. And I'm using okra as an example. I'm not sure if okra will work. But the idea is they will come, once they leave in those woods, they will hit that okra and then maybe spare your peppers. And it may not necessarily mean that they like okra better than pepper, but the, with respect to this insect, it seems once it, when it first hits a host plant, if that host plant is suitable, it would just stay there. So basically what it might be doing is intercepting it. And if any of you guys monitor football, you would know that Rex Grossman knows a lot about intercepting, so I think he would be a good job of, of teaching this particular strategy. Also, and I put this dollar sign, so I think this is a win-win situation. If your trap crop can also serve as a cash crop, if you can make money off of your trap crop, that's, that's even better. So for ecological management, there's two things we can say. One is try to plant your high-risk crops away from woodlots and shelters. And if you can't avoid that, possibly you can try to intercept them. And I use the term highly preferred host plant, a trap crop. But it may be just something that they like. Now with respect to chemical management, there are some organic products that are being tested. And this was a test that was done by my colleague, Galen Diley, um, this past summer. And basically, he, he did this again on peppers. And he sprayed the peppers on various dates in August. And then he went out and sampled the peppers, the entire plant. And he was trying to look at the number of brown marsh stink bugs per plant. And basically, what he found that there were some products, and I should mention here, this is untreated here. And I left that in white so you can easily compare it. But just focus on the total. He, it's divided into nymphs and adults, but you can just look at the total column. And we can see that there were some products that did pretty well. This is there is a new product, probably just came out last summer. It's a mixture of neem and pyrethrin. Again, all of these products are organic. And then, of course, the sulfur did pretty good. And then various mixtures of surround. Now, I was a little bit surprised that surround and sulfur didn't do better, because they have tested this in fruit trees, and it tend to do pretty good. So I, I'm not sure, but again, um, this was just one year, so this needs to be further tested to make sure that these, this works. The other thing I wanted to point out is, if you ever look at these tests, different insecticide tests with the synthetic products, there's always something that you're always going to realize, and that's with these synthetic products. These synthetic products are far more effective on the nymphs than the adult brown marsh stink bug. In many instances, you can have a 100% mortality kill of nymphs, and it barely touches the, the adults. But in this instance, what I'm finding in some instances, these products seem to be more effective on the adults than they are on the nymphs. And with respect to surround, probably what is happening is surround is more of an irritant. It doesn't kill it. But you spray it on the plants, the adults land on the plants, they're constantly trying to clean this stuff off of them, 
and they just sort of get irritated and they leave the plants. So probably what happened is in between when he was applying these products that he was getting recolonization of these adults. But in this, in the, with respect to surround, even when the adults try to recolonize, they will leave it. But the nymphs, they can't fly away, they're pretty much stuck there. So basically that's probably why it was more effective on the adults than nymphs in some situation. So basically among the insecticide we found among organics, the surround and azera, as well as surround and azera, different mixture, appears promising. But this was, test was done under low insect pressure. I still consider that low insect pressure, so you definitely want to test these products in the higher insect pressure. Now I want to finish by talking about some integrated IPM tactics, I think, and I think this may be the approach that we have to use once we gather enough information. So let's go back again to this trap cropping situation where the ideal is you know where they're coming from, you use a trap crop to protect your cash crop. But in some instances, if the population gets too high in that trap cropping, what happens? They spill over into your cash crop. So it means that you may have to come in with an organic product and spray that trap crop. And I know typically people, they prefer not to, prefer not to spray at all, but if you think about the amount of acreage that you have to play spray with respect to just protecting that trap crop versus the amount of spray you have to spray if you were trying to spray your entire cash crop. It's still a win-win situation. And then in some instances, you may want to use a double trap crop. For instance, we know that the adults, they love to feed on sunflower. And you may say, well, why don't we just use sunflower? And that's because the adults like to feed on sunflower, but it's not necessarily a good reproductive host. So they will feed on it, but then they're going to have to overposit their eggs. And where are they going to overposit their eggs? They're going to go right here. So by using this, you can possibly um, reduce the feeding, also reduce the feeding on your trap crop. If you want to use that to make money off of, and at the same time, you're protecting your pepper plants. Or you may say, well, you know, I don't want to use insecticide. I want to use my trap crop also as an insectary plant. In other words, an insectary plant is a plant that also brings in natural enemies. So maybe what you want to do is, along with that trap crop, once we determine which species and which plant they react to, you can put some flowering plants there. Again, this is going back to conservation biocontrol. And that would enhance the activity of those natural enemies. And basically, those natural enemies may be able to keep that brown mark stink bug in check, and you won't have that spillover effect. Another potential strategy is we call the push-pull system. I don't know if you ever heard of push-pull system. The way this works is that if you have a trap crop here, that's probably a good chance that you're going to get some misses. In other words, what we call escapes. There may be some brown mark stink bugs that simply don't go into this trap. They may overshoot the trap and land around the perimeter of this pepper field. So maybe what you can do is just along the border here, just along the border, you use something like surround. And remember what I said about surround is somewhat of an irritant. So basically what happened is those adults that overshoot your trap crop and land against this border, they get irritated by that surround and then what happens? It pushes them right back into that trap crop. So that's what we mean by push-pull system. And this is another one of those things, I think, in theory, that should work, but it's something that I have to test to make sure it will work. So, but the idea here is that you may not be, limit yourself to one single approach. You have to outsmart this bug. You have to throw a lot of different, show it that you're smarter and use a real integrated IPM approach. So with that, I have to acknowledge the Maryland Soybean Board. Um, they're the one who funded the soybean work that I looked at to cover crop. And also I had a um, USD grant that I also used to fund some of the corn work. I um, also have to acknowledge the graduate students who helped me out. And also the Maryland Grain Producer Utilization Board, they funded the, also helped fund that particular uh, uh, corn project that I did in looking at brown mark stink mud parasitization. And I think that should be it. So if you have any questions, I will try to address them at this time. Thank you. These hornets were especially effective at controlling the adult stage of brown marmorate stink bug. What's that? No, not a product. The, the 
the wasp. What oh, the wasp. The white face hornet. You know, it's a big group. Oh, it's like yeah. Paper wasps. Mm -hmm. and yeah. I actually had a, a, a nest on my property, which I looked at at the end of the season, and it was filled with them. Yeah, I, I, I can believe that because sometimes those paper wasps are opportunistic. In other words, if they see a source of food, they will continuously go to that source. So I can, I can certainly see that happening. Just like, just like if it was caterpillars. If you, if you had a crop that was full of caterpillars, they will continue to go to that source. And that's sometimes, this wasp may have never seen these brown mara stink bug, but they tend to, and that's one of the things we're interested in with these natural enemies who have probably never encountered a brown mara stink bug, where they see it as an opportunity and move on to it. And, and I can see that happening with paper wasps. You know what you said about most of us when we see a paper wasp nest, we're like, oh, we better get rid of it before somebody gets hurt. Right. Maybe that's the wrong approach to take. Yes. An another way you could do that is when, when I was a kid, I used to like to throw things at paper wasp and then run. But of course, you never do that alone. So what I will always do is have what I call a neighborhood race. And whoever I beat in that race, that's who I would invite to go throw at the rocks at it. Because I knew that I would be able to outrun them and they would get stung by the wasp. <laughs> but yes, that's what, I mean, I think that approach, some people were actually considering that maybe in the early 80s and putting these paper wasp nests in fields so that they would control, um, help control insect population. Um, when you say the word wasp, people immediately think, oh, you know, they're terrible things. But I would say 99.9% .9 of the wasps that we have basically do this. They're basically pest managers for us. Um, I recently came across some literature that discussed using quassin to keep uh, hop aphids off of plants. Have you heard of this or been able to use it in your methods? No, I'm sorry, I've never heard of it. It's the extract of bark of a South American tree called quassia. Okay. And it's a really strong insecticide repellent, but it's completely organic. Also, oh, hell. Yeah. Okay. In essence, yeah, it's supposed to keep them from bonding to the area because of its characteristics. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, but aphids they tend to they tend to zero in on their plants by contrasting the plant with the background. So this was indicate once they land on the plant, then they repel. Right. Okay. I see. Okay used in the stink bug population control? There's some, I mean, stink bug is, is basically, with respect to this one, not much has been done here. And like I said, because in the country of origin, it's really not considered a pest. So it's only a pest once it gets out of the country of origin and come to a place where, you know, it's, it's new. And some instances it takes, sometimes the natural enemies never adapt to it, and in some instances they do. In many instances, if it works, it actually works best if it comes to a country of origin and it's a natural enemy that it has never had any contact with. And that's because in its native country of origins, these guys are constantly changing. The brown marked stink bug is changing to try to outdo its host. The host is constantly changing so that it can attack the brown marked stink bug. But when it comes here, it has never had any contact with these natural enemies. So it may have not had a chance to adapt, to escape, you know, what these natural enemies can do to them. So in some instances, someone say the best biocontrol organism is, is the cousin of a biocontrol organism, one that's related to that one in its native habitat. And that's what we may see here. We may see it turn out to be more successful. saying using the um, French miracles um, and also you had mentioned also to using uh, some particular grass crops to bring in uh, beneficial insects. So in a, in a very small kind of intensive kind of say garden, say a community garden. So you would suggest putting quite a few of these uh, French miracles and other maybe grasses so, so the question was, um, he works with a community garden and he was interested in, would I recommend things such as the grass cover crops and using marigolds to try to increase the, um, the um, rate of natural enemy activity? I would think if you're working in a community garden, what you may see is that there's already a lot of diversity out there. Maybe adding a few flowering plants 
it could enhance it, but it may, may already be there. Uh, for instance, in this particular area where I took a lot of this data from, in the, uh, the vegetables, the peppers, the eggplants, the corn, the soybeans, this is a 42, something like a 42.3 acre of land. It wasn't organic, but there was a lot of things going on, a lot of different vegetable crops, a lot of field crops, a lot of weeds, forests, all kinds of plant diversity up there. So I think it was an ideal situation for this natural enemy activity to appear. So, so the question is, because when I show this data, everyone is shocked because most people, they can only get 5 10% kill rate. And I think it's the location. So one of the things I'm doing now is I'm moving the soybean study out to a different setting. And a, a setting where it's only surrounded by other soybeans and only surrounded by other corn. And that will give me a good indication how good these natural animals would be if they don't have all this diversity. For instance, like I said, some of these parasitoids, they need things to feed on. I mean, there's weeds and a lot of things going on in these diverse settings. So I guess my, my point is that in a community garden, you may already have a whole lot of diversity. So I'm, I'm not sure if it could enhance the situation or it may just sort of add more to it. So I'm not sure if it, you would get more out of it because there's probably already a lot of diversity going on out there. Is there anything in the wood lot for them to feed on to keep them out of your crop if you have something in there? And the question was, is there anything in the wood lots that you can probably keep them in the woods? My guess is what's happening in some particular instance is there, there are certain trees that they like, like the tree of heaven, some of the maple trees I think they go for. So I'm guessing what happens is, is with the stink bugs, there's certain stage, there may be certain stage phenology of those particular plants that make them a suitable food source. And once that plant staged into a non-suitable stage, in other words, they, they can't get what they need, that's when they start to move out and move into cropping system. So I suspect what happens is, and with this, what you sometimes see is wave of these guys. Sometimes you have a wave all of a sudden hit your cropping system. And you may say, okay, that wave is over if they're under control. And then you have another wave to come out of the forest. And my thoughts is whatever they're feeding on in that forest, it's be now become unsuitable and then now they're trying to look for a different host plant. So that would be sort of a, that's kind of an interesting question. Basically you're saying, well, if there's everything they need into that forest, maybe they won't move out. And then also another thing about this is just because they use a plant as a feeding host, they may not necessarily use it as a reproduction, reproduction host. So it could be something that they're feeding on the forest but now they want to lay their eggs, and they don't want to lay their eggs on the plant they're feeding on, so now they're looking for a different host as a reproduction host. I heard someone say that stink bugs wouldn't be as bad this year because we had a mild winter, and I wondered if that's just a rumor or if there's any correlation between the, you know, the, cold, the severity of the cold winter and then overwintering. Okay. The question was, would there be any connection between the severity of the winter and the number of stink bugs that you have. And, and that's true. Um, generally with this particular stink bug, as you know the behavior of it is to try to find buildings to go in and hibernate in. Um, and it is some tolerant to cold weather, but a part of that behavior is it's trying to get away from those harsh conditions. So if you do have a really harsh winter, the number that survived that winter would reduce. But then again, if you have a harsh winter, but have a lot of snowfall, then you, you may actually have more to survive because the snow is like an insulator to them. If they're underneath foliage and leaves, and that snow is actually warmer, so you can have more. So to answer your question, is sort of true in some instances. If you have a cold winter, you should have less survivor. But if you have a cold winter with snow, you may have more survivor. In this particular instance, is we have a very mild winter, you should have more to survive and more to come out. But then again, we have a lower number going into overwintering because the population was, was um, quite low this year, especially compared to uh, the previous summer. So it's gonna be interesting to see how that balance out with having more survivor, um, but having less to, to go in. But the interesting thing is, is some of the light trap data that was shown, especially in Beltsfield, is that the population were actually 500% higher than we saw the previous year. 
So I was in the field one day and my colleague said, hey, come, I want to show you something. He had just checked his light traps and he showed me hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these brown mark stink bugs in these light traps. And I looked at it and I said, you know, there's absolutely no way these natural enemies are gonna keep up with this guy. They're basically, it's not a chance. But then nothing happened. The population never reached high numbers. So partial of that could be these natural enemies are starting to move over and do a good job. Could have been the weather conditions we have, you know, I don't know if the heat sort of helps stress them out. Some people say that. I would think the heat only had a minimum impact on them and that's because you think about places like southern China where they can have six to seven generations a year. That would indicate that that's some warm weather conditions. But then we had the, the tornado or hurricane or what happened. That may have helped stress the population somewhat. So it would be interesting to see um, a lot of people have their different philosophies or theories of what happened with the population. And it may have been a cumulative things that, that caused that population to crash. How did the light traps work? And is it impractical to try something? Um, the question was how do the light traps work? Well, there's not like a pheromone or anything in the light traps. And basically, they're just attracted to the light. And, you know, during the night when they're flying around, it's the only light source and they're just attracted to the light and they go in. And I'm, what I'm not sure whether there was insecticide in the light trap or, or they just get in there and they can't get out. So if they get in there and they can't get out, if you have a high population in that trap, basically they, they kill each other just from, I guess, smothering things of that nature. Oh. These traps are easy to make, light traps? Not the, one they, the ones that they have. These are professionally built lights. Okay. 